Uh, I'm Tom Hincanius. I'm the director of FITM's Bachelor of Arts in Digital Marketing. Welcome to the future of brick and mortar. I'm so interested in the topic at hand this week. As a digital marketer myself, I've always believed in the omni-channel strategy. Um, some of you may remember when that was actually a thing and we talked a lot about omni-channel. We had to convince brick and mortar that they had to create an online presence and that that online presence had to some way, shape or form resemble their on-ground presence. Well, it seems like the world has flip-flopped on us and we may be headed in the opposite direction. Some interesting stats for you that we've picked up in the last few months. Business Insider reports 6,200 confirmed doors closing this year. Another source saying 20% of retail space would be closed by the end of 2020. That is the equivalent of 2 billion square feet of retail space. Doors closing include Nordstrom, uh, Tuesday morning, GameStop, Steinmart, Victoria's Secret, GNC, Sir La Tab. Of course, we've been talking about Sears and JCPenney for a long time, but they continue to close stores as well. In fact, just last week, Simon and Brookfield, the mall companies, both announced a joint agreement to purchase pennies. And just this week, Authentic Brands, the folks who own brands, including something like Forever 21, they are said to have been in the mix, not the first time all three of these companies together, Simon, Brookfield, as well as the authentic brands have been partnering to save a floundering retailer. Just a month ago, the retail headline around JCPenney was that we were switching from JCPenney to Amazon Fulfillment Center. Simon Properties was going to move Amazon into several of the closed JCPenney's and Sears stores. And from there, they would operate fulfillment centers, which of course doesn't mean that anybody would be shopping in those stores any longer. This headline alone, let me take you to the next one, really caught my eye and my attention. Uh, it says, Nike will no longer sell to Zappos, Dillard's, and other big retailers. That is a really interesting headline. In a statement to Footwear News to further explain this decision, Nike said, we are doubling down on our approach with Nike Digital and our own stores, as well as a smaller number of strategic partners who share our vision to create a consistent, connected, and modern shopping experience. Emphasis, of course, added on my part for that connected piece. Connected shopping experience. What does it mean? Well, oh yeah, Nike plans to open 200 smaller connected retailers just this year alone. So to recap all of this, a lot of stuff is closing. The people moving in are leaning heavily into technology, if they're going to even open the doors for consumers to walk through them, and may not even sell directly to their, their people. So our panel today has so much expertise, I can't wait for you to hear from all of them. Deborah Siegel is Vice President and General Counsel of Craig Realty Group. CRG develops, owns, operates several upscale factory outlets, including the Citadel here in Los Angeles, just a few miles from us, the outlets at San Clemente, Camazon, uh, they also own properties in Colorado, Utah, Wisconsin, and Arizona. And before CRG, I think it's also important to note, she worked in a similar role at Guess. We'll also be joined by Gail Jackson. She is a fashion industry executive. She also teaches here at the college. Uh, she served as an executive touching realty, a retail rather, private label, textiles, merchandising, some of the most fascinating insights I have heard about the future of retail coming from my friend Gail, which we'll hear from in a few minutes. But first though, I wanna start this afternoon with Larry Bruce, who is the director of stores at Saks Fifth Avenue. He's been leading the strategic growth of their retail stores since 2013. Before that, he was a VP and general manager at several Saks stores as well. So Larry, I'm hoping your camera is turning on because I'm not really seeing everything. Looks like you're there, great. Good. First thing you mentioned to me when we spoke in our pre-interview uh, was you were calling 2020 the year of change, even before what happened. Uh, so was this the sort of change you were expecting? You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, in some regards, yes. Yeah. So every year, you know, my team gets together and we, as many retailers do or many companies do, we decide, hey, what is our strategy going to be? And we put initiatives behind that. And based on what we had learned in 2019, really, we had started 2020 around this theme of it's the year to dare to disrupt. So we were thinking that coming into the year, and this was all about how our customer had continued to move forward 
was asking for different things, was shopping different ways. And we were all thinking about, we almost had to turn a lot of our foundations upside down and then really think about not only how we could catch up to this consumer, but quite frankly, being the retailers that we are, how we could continue really to be a step ahead of her. And listen, our basic model, as I think many of you know, is a relationship model. And we knew that what we needed to do was to really dig deep, deeper into those relationships, really make it even a little bit more personalized. And then what I would say, what, the, what also we were anticipating was we would kind of um, add into that the shot of analytics to really even get to know the customer um, a lot better as we, you know, as we move forward to the, to the year. So then COVID hit. And what I would say is we had the right thought processes in place. What, what had to happen is we had to push and execute much faster. And as I talk to colleagues in businesses, even outside of retail, it's pretty much a common theme, but we really thought, gosh, how can we um, really understand and be nimble? And, and listen, a lot of businesses are caught up on, let's test this, let's try it in one store, let's try it in two stores. And I think what we, the approach we took is kind of that old Nike thing, just do it. So it was more like get out there, just do it. And then I would say overall kind of a halo would be less is more. Mm -hmm. So how can you really take all that's out there, all of it, and to get the traction that you needed to kind of really zone in on what are those one or two, three things that would really make a difference post COVID to kind of move your, your business quickly and adapt it um, you know, based on the macro environment. So when I hear you describing this personalized shopping experience that's informed by AI and technology, I can't help but think about Amazon, right? That each one of us has our own unique homepage. It's designed yep. by AI, informed by my previous shopping habits. I can't imagine you want me to equate Saks Fifth Avenue with Amazon. So what, what is the difference? What is your point of differentiation there? So listen, first of all, I would say the, the analogy, there's relevance there for sure. I mean, I would say there is a little bit there. But I would say the nuance that, that I would speak to would be that relationship business that we have, that relationship model between the advisor, the style advisor, you know, the associate kind of, you know, the style advisor and the client. And that really does go beyond any experience that you would have with Amazon. I mean, believe it or not, there really are things that we know about our clients that Amazon doesn't know about theirs. So, you know, many of our clients have two, three, four homes. They bought two sweaters and we know what homes those sweaters are in. We know about their spouses, about their partners, about their husbands. We know where they vacation. We know about their churches, their charities. And quite frankly, not only are we able to use that, that relationship, we're also able to use it in a way to also anticipate future needs as well. And I, I think lastly, what I would comment on that, on that differentiation between um, you know, what you were saying, Amazon and, and Saks is that, listen, we, we can obviously service our clients in a more personalized manner, but trust me, we are still utilizing both channels. So we are utilizing brick and mortar and we are utilizing our digital business and really technology is enabling us to use it in a more personalized manner. It, it's such an interesting time to be in retail. And I have to imagine the experience of the last six months have informed you dramatically about the future of brick and mortar, specifically for Saks, but also more generally. And I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are as you look forward. I mean, listen, this, this topic in general, I could go on probably for hours. I mean, this one is you know, this one is, there's been so many learnings. So I think the first thing is, I've said this before, but the first one is this whole thing around relationships are key. And, and we saw right out of the gate. So I closed the whole fleet of stores and right out of the gate, we saw that our advisors were able to still continue with those relationships and still generate business. So I think that was the one thing that we saw, okay, right away we saw those relationships are even more, maybe more important than we thought there were. The second thing is, I mentioned this before, this whole thing around being nimble, but also around innovation. So it's not just innovation around product, which is what we tend to think about, 
as retailers. We think it's always about the product. No, there, we had the opportunity to level set our business and all these things that have built up over a period of time that we thought we had to do or we wanted to do, we really could take the opportunity to say, hey, how do we want to do them differently? That could be around structure in the store. It could be around promotions. Or the last thing would be it's around selling. And how did we have to sell differently? And that's one of the things that we picked up on right at, you know, immediately was, gosh, how does selling look different with this macro environment? And one of the things was selling services. And what are those things that we are gonna, what was our customer looking for? So we opened our doors up and listen, some customers were very keen on coming in right away, but you know what? Some weren't or some wanted to come in different ways. So listen, we, we had just quickly had shown a slide a, a second ago and what I was just going to comment on there was there's just a couple of the things that, that um, we did to kind of react to this macro environment. And one of them was we called it uh, Shop New York. So typically our clients in the past, part of you know, their rep repertoire of shopping would be they would come to New York two, three times a year. We would build experiences around that. So whether it was Broadway shows, restaurants, uh, many different things, obviously, you know, shopping the flagship. So we said, okay, how can we still do that? How can we still have these experiences for our clients, but obviously without them, you know, coming to New York. So we built something around that digitally and, and created experiences with that. Um, listen, I put down here by appointment selling. That's nothing new for sure. But what we did do and where we did see an opportunity was we thought, okay, well, we're not going to have as many clients and we're not going to have as much foot traffic. Let's shrink our store hours and let's use those hours before we open because now we're not opening till noon or after hours. And now let's create these experiences for clients who are not interested in shopping when we kind of have our regular foot traffic in the door. Doesn't mean that they had the store all to themselves, but what it did mean is we were able to create these experiences by really, really limiting to just a handful of appointments a day, what that shopping experience could be like. And then the last one I, again, I'm just gonna touch on was this concept about try before you buy. So these are customers that would typically shop in our locations, you know, sometimes a couple of times a week and they wanted to be serviced in a different way. So how, and again, we were used to pulling things for them and holding them and having it. So now we're like, listen, we can still do this for you and we'll send it to you and we'll come pick it up for you. Or, you know, there was just this whole thing around a different way to kind of bring that store experience to the client until they were ready, um, you know, until they were ready to, to kind of step foot in, into the location. Hmm. Um, I've spoken with so many brands recently and brick and mortar retailers who are adjusting to this new business model, the changing times. Uh, I spoke to one who asked me not to say who they were, who said that uh, in the past, pre-COVID, 20% of sales were coming online. Uh, they have now shifted their business model and all of their bottom lines to expect about 50% of retail to come from online. I I'm just curious if you guys expect something similar at Saks or are you just that different a retailer that the on-ground experience is so significant that you, you can't, it, it, there's no equation. Listen, I'm not going to talk specific percentages, but what I would, what I would tell you is that, first of all, I think it's too early. Like none of us really know yet. I think we just don't know. I think we're going to have to kind of get through this year and then we'll have it, we'll, we'll be able to speak um, more specifically about, you know, what that change is, but there's no question. Listen, no, we're not that different. Tom, to answer your question, we're not that different. And we are definitely going to see a shift there. But how I look at it from a strategic point of view, and I mean this sincerely, I'm not just saying that, really what I'm focused on and what my team is focused on is how do we insert our team of amazing professional sellers into the digital channel to then over totally elevate that total experience. And that again, I think is our competitive edge. And that's when we're talking about different types of technology or selling or whatever we wanna do, that's, those are the types of initiatives that, that we're looking at almost in a sense to fuse kind of that digital and store experience and, and, what, and what could that look like. It's, it's also interesting, I could, as you said, you could speak for a while on all this and I could ask you a million more questions. We do have two other panelists. We'll put you on pause for a moment. Okay, I, want, 
remind the folks at home that Larry is going to hang around and we will have a Q&A session at the end. We've reserved about 15 minutes, 20 minutes of time at the end to take your questions. And so we welcome you to submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I want to switch our focus from the retailer to the people who own and operate the space. Deborah Siegel uh, is joining us next. She's the Vice President General Counsel of the Craig Realty Group. As I mentioned before, uh, they operate, if you're in Southern California, you probably have been to one of their properties, whether it was Cabazon, the San Clemente outlets, um, even the Citadel here, just, just uh, what, east of downtown. Um, Deborah, uh, as you get your camera and your audio turned on, I, um, and my first question to you is, you told me something very interesting when we were talking last week. You said your tenants are actually doing really well right now. And I'm curious if you can explain that to me. How are they doing well when everything that we read is not so good for retail? Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me, FIDM. And uh, I wanna preface that with doing really well uh, based on the current times versus pre-COVID. So obviously there were, we're in several states and there were periods um, that we shut down in various states. And uh, other than California, um, and we are open in California, but California, I think, is the only state that itself is not fully open. All our malls are outdoor, for one, okay? So when indoor malls were closed, we did see um, increased traffic because people could not go to the indoor malls. Second, I think, because of the pandemic, they recommend staying outside. So when you're shopping outside, you feel safer, you're not as worried. We do obviously have masks and, and require masks, but it's a much more pleasant shopping experience. And I think it's much safer shopping experience. We also, at our malls, we are not anchored by department stores. No offense to Larry, we do love Saks Off Fifth, by the way, um, but we were not, uh, hurt by closures of the JCPenney or Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom. Not that Neiman's is still open and Nordstrom is still open. I know, uh, Tom, you mentioned them closing, uh, but uh, we were not affected by any type of big, we call them anchor tenants that suddenly folded. So ours is, I think, more of a shopping experience. I think you go back to ancient Roman Greece. People like a marketplace. People like to get out there and shop. Um, and we have noticed that we, the majority of our tenants are open. Yes, there are some shorter hours at certain centers, especially for the food group. But the ones that are open are doing surprisingly well. I think there was some pent up demand. People didn't shop for a few months and people like a bargain. So we're seeing lines and we're seeing some pent up demand at the majority of our stores, both apparel, shoes, shoes for sure. And then as I, I uh, we did open a restaurant, believe it or not, um, in the middle of this. What was great about that story, it's in San Clemente, it's called Asada Cantina. And during the pandemic, while we were still building the restaurant, we did have the opportunity to make some changes and make it more outdoor and the majority of the restaurant is now outdoor. It has a roof but open on all sides and therefore when it opened it's been super popular, two hour waits and I think people are craving you know new experiences and you can still be successful uh, in these businesses that are going out. Maybe it's an opportunity for some because so many are closing. Um, it's, it's interesting to me that you talk about the experiences because I, I think about the outlet and it's clearly it's not in the city for the most part. Normally we have to drive to get to it. San Clemente is kind of a little different, at least is, is a little more urban than maybe some of your others. But is, is that the experience you offer? You, you mentioned the bargain hunting. Is, is that when you come to an outlet, is that what I'm after? Am I, am I the bargain shopper and I'm there for the hunt? And that's my experience? Uh, I do think that's part of the experience. I think hunt can be defined relatively. It's not like a TJ Maxx or a Marshalls where you literally are, you know, digging down in the bins and going through a lot of 
Uh, this is more, uh, especially like at Citadel and some of our outlets, we have uh, Furla, we have Giorgio Armani, you know, there's high end, there's mi middle, there's low end, and it's not, uh, it's not broken groups. Generally, it's full groups, people, but most, um, most uh, tenants buy for the outlets in particular. I think with the high end, it is, um, it is from their stores or uh, seasonal, uh, seasonal. But I do think it's, yes, people like to get a bargain. People often buy more or in multiples. Um, but I don't think it's a hunt as in like a, well, like Lowman's used to be or like a Marshall's TJ Maxx, where you're exhausted by the end and you may find a thing or two. <laughs> Um, I miss Keep in the mind, we also have Citadel, which is near Los Angeles, and that is has restaurants, food courts. We're thinking of building a fountain like the Bellagio type fountain and making even more community oriented. So there's a lot going on there, irrespective of the brick and mortar outlet piece. Well, and this, this gets to something you and I kind of talked about the other day, right? It used to be the outlet was the outlet. You went and, and that was the experience. End of story. You are now merging what, what used to be more of the mall experience into the outlet at a time when the malls are shutting doors. So it, it almost seems counterintuitive, but you're telling me this business model works for you. Why? One, because it's outdoors. Um, and two, because it is more a community, especially like Citadel, San Clemente, our outlets in Colorado, it's the place to go. Um, even in San Clemente, we're building a movie theater. So we're making it more entertainment oriented, experiential, and not just about apparel and footwear shopping. Mm. Um, as you, I, I'm going to ask you to look through the lens of maybe your former hat or former glasses at um, guests. If you were advising retailers today, and I know you've been around for long enough to have seen some heydays and some low, and we know that everything's circular, do you, what, what would your advice be to a retailer or a mall operator that isn't doing as well as the outlet space is? Come to the outlets. <laughs> um, well, then that begs the question. If you're going to tell me come to the outlets, does that mean the outlet is no longer the outlet, really? Like you've, you've basically redefined what the mall for the masses, so to speak, would be. You're not going to get the anchor store of the, the Saks Fifth Avenue. You're going to get the anchor. You, well, you don't want the anchor store, right? We don't have the space for the anchor stores. I mean, we don't. Um, but I, I would say a lot of full price retailers do have outlet concepts and do have an outlet division, even Saks with their off fifth. Keep in mind that I think uh, Neiman Marcus closed their last call, the whole division. Um, but I think for, for full price, they do need a place to clear the goods, especially now. We're doing pop-ups now. Lululemon, who generally did not do outlets, had, they had a few here and there without much of a discount. We've signed a few deals for them to be doing pop-ups in a few of our malls for a year and see how they do. So there are some non-outlet retailers that are still looking at outlet. And there's been uh, between some restaurants, uh, exercise, yoga studios, um, et cetera, different types of services that are now leasing traditional space that was for a retailer. When you think about the perfect retailer as we move forward after COVID at the outlet space, what if you could dream up the perfect person to attract to your outlet, who? Who is that? What are they offering in store? Somebody that's not currently in the outlets? Sure. Or maybe one that's currently in the outlet that just looks so perfect, you could use them as a perfect point of comparison. Well, on the, uh, on the apparel and footwear side, 
Nike is a big draw for the outlets and does a very large outlet business. Uh, on the restaurant side, I think anything that's new and unique and offers an experience is doing well because people now go for more than shopping. They want to eat. Um, if there's entertainment, they're willing to look at that. We have at certain of our malls, San Clemente and Citadel, a, a VIP center. That is the new Asada restaurant at San Clemente on the right, oh, and the left. Um, so hopefully when we are back to bars being open, that can be fully, fully open, that part too, but it's doing well otherwise. Um, and I was in the middle of a sentence and now I lost where I was, Tom, so. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to let me let me introduce Gail and get another perspective on all this. And then, Deborah, if you'll just stand by, we'll come back to you uh, again. There's q and A. I I can see is already loading up down there. Um, so we will come back to you in just a moment. In the meantime, let me introduce uh, Gail Jackson, who is an instructor at FITM and also has had a very impressive career in the C-suite as well as VP of product. She's been a DMM. And I'd like to start, Gail, as you get your camera and your mic turned on, to where do you think the opportunity moving forward exists? Hi there. Hi. Um, I, think, I think this is, we talk about all the negatives. Store closing, we've been overstored for three decades. We've gotten to the point where it's, oh, oh, hum, then the internet comes in and the web buy, and now we have to really reimagine the whole retail experience. And it is exactly that. It's the re, it's re, it's retail tainment. It's how do we use those spaces now? We're going to have empty spaces. So it doesn't have to be doom and gloom. It really, to me, is the new opportunity. It's great. So how do we do and build immersive experiences? So we have a customer that needs, so we have an added thing we have to bring into the picture. They want experience, they want connectivity, they want discovery, and they need safety. Mm. All these spaces have to be rethink, thought out, reimagined, and again, all be consumer centric. But so the concern we need, they need to be convenient. They have to provide experience, education. They also have to be safe. Build the confidence of the consumer that they're safe to go to. When you think about the, the, the what you're describing, mm -hmm. and you'll forgive the term, but it does sound like we're going old school. When you talk about experiences, in other words, you're, you're looking at personalization, you're looking at galleries, uh, isn't that more the department store of your, your, your the foundations of your career? Yeah, it is. It, it is, but in a new world, in a new world, and we add technology and the integration of technology at every touch point. Like, of course, look at the customer loyalties. These, these big, until the 80s, these these department stores. They were the major outlet for people to buy fashion, right? So what happened? They were the place, they were community. People came to them for events. Some examples would be uh, Bloomingdale's. Bloomingdale's, Marvin Traub was the president of Bloomingdale's. They had the interior, they had um, Barbara Darcy, who was the G GMM and ended up of uh, the home division, but she did all these wonderful designer rooms. And then later, and these were events twice a year, they would totally change and they would be events, customer would be waiting to be on the invitation list to be there the first day. They'd last for about six months, they'd go down. And then in later in the eighties, they invited key designers to do this. So it was a huge event. The other thing Bloomingdale's did is they had an international fair. And they had a different country every year and every buyer in the store, and I remember this because I used to travel with them, every buyer in the store would go and search for, in that country, things that they could bring into the store. If not, they would have them made. It was a huge event. And it lasted two weeks. They took two floors in the, the uh, 59th Street store. and it was theater. It was great. 
Then we look at Stanley Marcus. He had the Fortnite. The Fortnite was the social event in Dallas. Everybody wanted to go. They waited until a month before just to know what the theme was. Who was it going to be? Which country were they going to honor? What was the theme going to be? Then we go also now today, we, um, then there was Geraldine Stutz, Bendel's in New York with the Street of Shops, where she brought in uh, designers that weren't known and different shops um, that you wandered through the stores if you were on a main street, but it was highly curated, very curated. And she used both international designers and local designers. Young designers on every Tuesday between the hours of 9 and 12 could march up there without an appointment with their portfolio, with their samples, and maybe they'd make it into Bendel's. So it was both industry interactive, but most of all this is customer-centered, total customer-centered and an experience, and an experience of discovery, of newness. So that they came, they wanted to go, and they were loyal. Customers were very, very loyal. And, you know, I think this can be translated again today. And, well, you, hmm? see examples, I know you're going to talk a little about William Sonoma, right? Like you and I talked about that last week. They have won me over because of the experience every time I'm there. And they still do it. They still do it. Every time you walk into, there is discovery. Whether they're cooking a new recipe, there's scent. It touches all the senses. Mm. And these new retail spaces and new business models are going to have to touch and invigorate all the senses. That is the true experience. And Williams-Sonoma, when I'm thinking about today, is one of the few that still do it and do it well in multiple locations. That's, not a, that's what happened, I think, a lot. As these branch stores kept opening and opening and opening, they couldn't execute, or they just didn't couldn't, didn't, wouldn't, I don't know what. So, you know, and then today we also now look, think of Levi. Levi now has, and they're going to roll it out to more stores, customization rooms where you can bring in your old denim, they can fix it, they can customize, they can put patches, they can embroider it, they can do whatever you want. Patagonia, doing the same thing with repair and bringing people in another kind of experience. Um, and and uh, also, um, so there are things happening starting now, but then um, it's, it's a very exciting thing. And I think this is what makes new space a new vision of being customer centric, because I do believe our customers are much more advanced than our retail business models. Do you think uh, five years from now, 2025, uh, will malls be closed? What will happen with the spaces that are there now? Some will maybe, and some won't. Some will be, re if they're re, that space, if it's reimagined, can become very important because what you really want to make those spaces is destination spaces. And we can create those by redesigning experimental, um, exper experiential, I'm trying to say, um, venues. So we also have to think about the way the population is starting to move. First of all, the millennials are at, uh, millennials are at um, child raising years and moving out of cities. And they're also moving out of cities because of all the cost of living. And now we're working remote and we don't have to be in a city to actually work and make a good substantial income. So all of these kind of things are happening. So if the right investment people get involved and the right creative people, the spaces can become alive again mm -hmm. and have a wonderful new venue. And that's going to be a combination between entertainment, food, art, uh, retail, of course, all of it. So it's even when uh, Deborah was talking about the experience in her real estate the successful real estate part. That, think about that. That's kind of what it is. It's not just to sell clothes at a price. They go there for all kinds of reasons. I think about, I lived in Greenville, Mississippi, a very small town in Mississippi at the beginning of this century. And uh, it had a mall and the mall was dying a rapid death. And I think now only like you can only enter the stores from the outside. I think the inside even pre-COVID, you couldn't even get to the inside of, of the, the mall at, at a point in time at least. And so it's interesting to think about this notion or concept that now because of COVID, 
we could potentially send more people back to Greenville because mom and dad live in Greenville and, and therefore I should live in Greenville so they can help raise my kids or so that I can help take care of them as, as they get older. Um, my parents are watching right now. I should make it clear. I'm not from Greenville. I just was there. I'm from LA. My parents live in LA. Um, but it's, it's interesting as you think about that uh, and, and you think about this retailtainment and you think about these opportunities that exist to rebrand and regrow what once was a successful thriving operation. I, I wonder what you've seen as you explore. I know you go out quite a bit and take a look at the retail around us. What, what do you see as the future of retail? Well, I think, I, I think the most inspiring things that are happening right now First of all, it has to be entertainment, it has to be convenient, it has to be safe. Sad, right? Mm -hmm. But the newest exciting and inspirational to all kinds of retail, all kinds of locations would be Showfields in New York. It is incredible. It is a unbelievable experience. They talk about, they don't use its art, its entertainment, its food, it's discovery. It's the magic of discovery. It's highly curated. It's the ability of using this space. Now, you can go in, a, a young designer, they added who they're going to get, but the designer, they can either pay $5,000 a month or fifteen, dollars depending on the amount of space they have. So they're basically, it's a new home for pop-up shops of highly creative people. So it's a new retail, it's a new real estate model also. It looks so much like the Bendel model that you showed just a couple minutes ago. Yeah, but it's today, using all kinds of technology to enhance this experience over and beyond. But it, it, it basically, it really is. It's the street of shops, but now we have art, we have entertainment, we have avant-garde things that are just happening. So we wanna go, it's, it's a place for discovery. And it's truly a destination. So the other one that is going on, like, like show, I think Showfields, I mean, you go in, I think it's 14,000 square feet. It's in NoHo, in New York. Three young people started it. It started and they've been funded now. You know, they're funded, I think they're in their second round. It started in 2017. It opened last year in 20, or in 2019. And you know, you go up, uh, there's, oh, there's a lab where you actually buy some of the things you see and interact with. There is a, you go to the fourth floor and there's a picture I think you have of the slide where you actually literally slide into the magic of discovery. It's, it's great. It's not crazy. It's great. But it's this kind of creative, imaginative thing. And it's all really focused on the customer and the customer relationship. In, in our limited time before we get back to everybody, tell me about Area 15 in Vegas, because you want to talk about technology. This seems like the place. Oh my gosh, it's incredible. Area 15 opened last month. Of course, it was planned to open pre-COVID. So it's all a data point. It had at 30 different touch points. It, it has all different kinds of data driven. They even had the line to get in after, because of COVID was virtual. They had a virtual line where the customer could actually see where they were, what the time amount. In the store, they have technology that is th thermal. They can measure the temperatures of, uh, of uh, and it's uh, to the customer and they're in the store, they can also see where the crowds are. So think about this in the future. If there are too many people at too many different venues, they then send people over to move them away so they are safe and they're you know, socially distanced and all that. But think about it also to send the right people in there to help them and service them if it were in a regular store environment with this kind of technology. It's so you're planning and you're of people, you know, the productivity part of it. Change. I mean, it's wild. It's games, it's art, it's retail, and that one slide showed you the layout, how it was going to work as a layout. So it's, it's pretty, there's some really cool things happening. And I think they're very inspiring, and I think they can be transformed into these old models to be new models and regenerate the life in those dead spaces. I, I'm going to ask you quickly because I've been looking through some of the Q&A and I, I think this might be applicable, but I'm curious your take on this. Is, is this only a place where people with money can play? 
do you, you to build what you just looked at area 15 is going to cost you a fortune so where does the startup get into this actually you it, it doesn't have to you mean to be a retailer in there to be a retailer at all in 2020 to have a brick and mortar presence do you need a ton of money no you have to find an idea and a unique idea that brings value and joy, joy can be part of the value, to a consumer and you can go, the entry level still to the web isn't that expensive. You go and, and test it or you get to be recognized by the founders of Showfields or the founders of Area 15 and they, because they're curating to continually have new discovery. Mm. So it doesn't need to be a huge investment. Once you're in it, and it, you also can do short term. The old investment used to be you'd have to sign a five year lease, right? To right. get retail space in a good place. Right. Now you can go into some of these places and maybe you only go in for a month and then you re up because it's that pop up idea as well. It's, as I invite everybody else, uh, Larry and Deborah, to turn your cameras on to join us for some q and I will say it's, it's interesting because at the college, we've recognized this transition. The way we teach entrepreneurship today is way more similar to what you would look at something coming out of Silicon Valley than you would have a brick and mortar store from 20 years ago. That, this has to be the approach to it. Um, which I think is super interesting. Larry, uh, as you, uh, welcome back. Uh, as you come back in, several questions came in for you uh, while you were up. How do you manage all that you know? They're specifically referencing when you talked about the person who had two sweaters and you know if it went to their vacation home versus their, their daily home. Where's the data st stored, managed? How big a piece of the operation is that, that data management? So, it, um, listen, it's really a credit to the caliber of the people that we're fortunate enough to have in the stores. So it is managed by that advisor. And I would say a little bit of it is old school. So a little bit of his memory, but obviously we do have technology that allows our advisors to set up actually profiles and even views of customers' closets to know specifically what's in a customer's closet at a point in time. Mm, it's, <laughs> that's just wild to me. Yeah. Uh, another question for you, Larry. When Nordstrom acquired Hotlook, they really accelerated their transition from brick and mortar to online. Uh, is Saks planning to accelerate this transition similarly? Are you in a different space? I don't think, listen, Nordstrom's is a competitor, although everyone's a competitor these days. But um, I, listen, we've always recognized the importance, as everyone has, of, of, of maximizing the digital opportunity. So I don't, I wouldn't say it's amped up or accelerated any more kind of pre or post COVID. I think something natural might happen, which is kind of one of the questions we talked about early. There might just be a natural maybe. So maybe what I talked about at the beginning was maybe it would have taken us five years or something to get to the point that we might get to by the end of this year. I think that's what we just don't know. Um, Heath Owen asked an interesting question for you, Deborah. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people watching might have the same question. What kind of rent abatement and help are you seeing is being provided to struggling businesses, specifically for small businesses? Is there a lot of opportunity for that right now? That's an excellent question. And obviously that has been happening. Um, what we have found to be quite honest is the mom and pops have been better than the big giants in paying rent. I think most of the mom and pops were able to get the PPP loans and um, and many of them are franchisees like Auntie Annie's at the mall, et cetera. They were able to get the loans and they have been paying their rent. In terms of rent abatement, uh, as you know, we have mortgage, we have banks that have loans to our center. So we have lenders, they're not abating anything. So we generally are not able to abate anything. What they are doing is pushing it out either till the end of the loan or till next year and paid pro rata over time. So we're trying to help tenants by doing the same thing. Um, not abating rent, but um, not forgiving rent, but basically postponing it to a uh, time when hopefully they're open again and can pay it off in increments over time. I wanted to say one other thing that I didn't say earlier, and that is in terms of why are some tenants doing well now in the malls? I forgot to mention 
conversion, Larry probably can add to that. We are seeing that the people that are shopping and are waiting in line and are going in, we are hearing from our tenants that the conversion rate is much, much higher than pre-COVID. So people that are going shopping, want to buy stuff, want to come home with stuff. It's not just looky-loos um, in this time. Larry, do you see that experience also? Yes, we do. Unfortunately, one of the kind of the highest converting um, segment of customers we had were the tourists and international tourists at that. So, uh, you know, obviously we've lost them, but yes, in general, we have definitely seen the same pattern, yes. I want to uh, ask a question that someone posed, uh, and I, I think I'll direct it first maybe to Gail, but I, I'm curious to get both, all, all three of your takes on this. Um, she speaks to show, this anonymous attendee, so the showrooming has been going on as a small retailer for more than a decade. They see that people come for discovery, they come for the destination, but that does not translate into sales, regardless of the relationships. In the end, the trend that ultimately is killing these smaller retailers is people shopping online because, and I think this is a key word, perceived purchase for less. Is, is that something, Gail, that you think a brick and mortar retailer can overcome? Yeah, I think this experience, be, the experiences we provide, they have to be wow, they have to be immersive, they have to be across all areas of interest or as many of the senses that you can, because otherwise you're going to be price driven and you're never going to beat Walmart and you're never going to beat Amazon. So this, this is what this is all about. This is to not be a price driven and have a different center on value. And I, that's, what, that's what we have to do. Otherwise, more people are going to go out of business. More stores are going to close because you, you can't sell it for nothing. Larry, I realize we don't know what this person sells, but they're claiming they're a small retailer. Do you, do you, I mean, I, I get what Gail's saying. You've got to focus on experience, experience, experience. Do you agree with that? Or is there something? I mean, I definitely agree. You're never going to win if you focus on, we're never going to win if we focus on price for sure. I would also say, you know, I know Gail spoke a lot about experience, experiences out there. You know, I feel we can look to the European model. I, you know, I mentioned that a couple of times. I think, you know, things like that we have tested that has worked very well for us. You know, we put a whole grocery store in some of our stores and who would have thought ever in, in you know, in the United States that would work, but it does work and it does bring a different element to, to the store. So I think, I'm not sure what this retailer was, but if it was just about price, you're, you're not going to win on that. But I do feel, listen, this is the retailer in me. If you have a right product or you have a right thing that's on trainer of the moment, that is enough. It is not, now listen, you need exposure, you need all the other stuff too, but listen, at the end of the day, that still is what drives our business. Key product, key passion, you know, key fashion trends. Sometimes you need people to educate you on them or understand why, but that is still a relevant commodity at this moment in time that our customer base is still engaged with. Deborah, I'm curious your take on this because you sort of are, are claiming to offer both in a way, right? Price and experience. That is correct. And I also think that there's room for both the internet and brick and mortar. I think they're symbiotic to tell you the truth. I think if you're going to buy a book, it's easy to buy that online. Same size, you know what you're getting. I think it's harder with apparel for sure. And I think people like to touch and feel the fabric and maybe try it on. And I, I, I mean, I personally use both. I think, I think both are here to stay. I don't think one's going to cannibalize the other, especially in certain categories. Uh, a question from another anonymous attendee. Uh, they say, with the dichotomy of millennials moving to the suburbs, but the experiences that have been discussed being primarily in cities, will these shopping experiences now become more destinations? In other words, will they be more planned, planned events? Larry, I think you can speak to this pretty well, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, you're saying for the future, if this is what we do see happening. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, this is what, again, this is part of an overall bigger strategy. We will have to come up with these things and what do they, you know, look like. The only thing that I would comment on what kind of what Gail was saying is what I think is yet to be seen is you still need a velocity of customers to make these 
these experiences and these tests and these pop-ups profitable. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of these secondary markets, there just isn't that velocity of customers yet. So we'll have to see, again, how many people do actually end up moving home and what does end up happening. And that's why typically you still see these th types of things happening. You know, she referenced New York, whatever, kind of still in the bigger cities, because you do kind of have that breadth of clients and interests, you know, still in the communities. Anybody else have a take on that one? Shopping experience is not in the A-level markets as we look at the B and C-level markets. Gail? Yeah, well, B and C-level markets. So it's back to the customer. It's customer-centric. If that's who your customer is, income, culture, attitude, all of that, right? Then you come up with the venues that will do this, will, will engage them. It doesn't have to be all high level. What about local artisans? What about local workmen people that can do something? What about a fair for uh, having some kind of fair in a community for community service? Raising money, having space for community things to help the community. I mean, there's all kinds of idea I could be go on and on forever, of course. But to me, it's just such an exciting time to rethink and redo and reconnect. So regeneration. <laughs> A couple pandemic related questions came in. Um, trying on smelling products has been limited, uh, if not eliminated for in-person shopping. What can brick and mortar do to provide a better, safer experience, especially when many cannot do um, to, to try on, go to try on, I think is what they're saying, and send back the products. Um, I don't know, Deborah, it's, it seems kind of analogous to when you guys built the restaurant, you, you considered that in the, the construction of the cantina in San Clemente, but is there other thoughts on, on that part of retail? Uh, well, oh. I can't really speak toward tenants, maybe Larry would, but I can speak by my own experience and where I have shopped they do allow you to try on, but then you drop it off with them, you know, and they take it from there. So it doesn't go right back onto the floor. Um, I think, well, my personal opinion is this virus is not touch related, it's airborne. So I, I'm glad we're all sanitized and keeping everything clean, it's great. But I have not heard of anybody saying they touched something and therefore that's how they got it. It's generally extended time period in closed rooms with somebody who may or has the virus. So I, have, I haven't seen uh, stores lately where you can't try something on. Um, I want to go back to something else that Gail said, because just to tell the group, we at our malls have been doing uh, drive-in theaters now. There's a company called Starlight Movies that's completely sold out that comes and uh, facilitates drive-in movies on. Uh, we have a lot of parking lot area and it's not covered, so that works for that. Um, in addition, on a couple weekends, a church has asked to use our space for a church service outside, and that's been a big hit too, and that's also symbiotic because our restaurants that are open, Ruby's Diner, Asada, they all can take orders and deliver, et cetera, so there's a lot of things going on, like all this outdoor dining that normally wouldn't be going on. And hopefully that will change the way of the future, Gail. I've seen many cities now with, you know, restaurants spilling over onto the street and the sidewalk like in Europe. And why, why don't we do that in the US? It's a great experience in Europe. Why do we have such stringent, stringent rules and regulations? Hopefully we'll see that change permanently. Just to, to what Larry was saying, saying earlier. Larry, I wonder if I can direct this, and it may be our last question, but I, I'd like to direct it at you. Somebody wrote in that they went to a top mall in Northern California, I'm assuming it's called Valley Fair. Retailers were not stocked, the mall was a ghost town, went to interact with the product. She's asking, will stores ever be in stock at a level closer to their online offerings, or is that a thing of the past? For I, 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 mean, I, I think, not. listen, in terms of the breadth of offering, I mean, it's going to be, again, I'm not sure what level. I mean, I haven't been to Valley Fair in years, but 
in in terms of the breadth of offerings, it, I would say no. It's we're not going to be able to compete with that. Short term, probably what this person ran into, which many of us ran into. Listen, our stores were closed for a period of time. We cut a lot of our open to buy. The little bit of open to buy that we did, we honestly put it into um, our online, you know, because that's made sense. And then where as we started to reopen, that's where the inventory went. Again, if you go back to and and I do believe in this passionately. Our consumer, I'm saying the luxury consumer, but all consumers are so much more comfortable now with technology. They're much more comfortable walking in a store. As long as you have a dominant offering, they're willing to get that supplemented by the, as long as the advisor can still get them the blouse or the underpinning or the extra pair of shoes. So we don't carry the black, we carry the fashion in store. They want the black and they want the, you know, whatever, go with it. They're much more comfortable shopping that way now. So yeah, I, I, would, I would say, no, we're not gonna ever have that breath. But again, there are, that's what I'm saying. If you could almost fuse these two experiences, it, I, I think it minimizes that. Uh, and, and by the way, if you have the right person helping you and knowing you, part of what you want is someone to edit the buy and all those offerings. You don't want to spend all your time. Listen, our clients do not want to spend all their time online and looking at everything. They're kind of looking for someone to say, hey, you know me, you tell me kind of what's the best thing, what's the best size, what's the best color. You know, they always like a little sense of, of expiration as well, but overall they're on the whole, as it relates to retail and, and ready to wear, they're not looking for, to spend hours online shopping. We've, we've talked about technology. We've talked about more of the European experience. We've talked about a return to personalization. I'm going to give each of you 15 seconds. When you think of the trends we've looked at today, what should a retailer be paying attention to if, if they hope to stay in brick and mortar? If there was one thing, what would you tell them? I think I'll start with you, Larry. It's a cliche, the customer. In less than 15 seconds. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Deborah, how about you? What is that one thing a retailer should be looking at today? Well, I'm coming from the landlord perspective, as you know, um, and I think it's a, a mixed a mixed experience between you know retail, entertainment, education, and just an outdoor area that's safe and fun and a place a gathering place. I think a gathering place. Okay. Gail? I'm going to say, I agree with both, right? Number one, it's the customer, but it's the customer, it's engaging that customer, connecting, engaging, educating, them, and making it fun instead of tedious, but giving them what they want so it converts. I appreciate the three of you so much for this hour um, and, and the time you put in beforehand speaking to me directly. Larry Bruce from Saks Fifth Avenue, Deborah Siegel from Craig Realty Group, and Gail Jackson from FIDM and, uh, and many things before us. We're so lucky to have you. We appreciate all three of you and the, the relationship you have with the college is just meaningful so much to us. So thank That's you. That's a great experience. Larry. Thank you. Uh, a kick, quick programming note, uh, we're back next month. Uh, if those of you who've been following us for some time know that we were doing these every two weeks. We're now doing them once a month to make it a little bit easier on, uh, on our crew here at FITM. Uh, next month, on the second Tuesday of the month, where they will be sitting from now on, is the future of entrepreneurship. We have two founders, actually we have three founders. Uh, Indy Lee is the founder of her namesake brand. Bethany Frankel is the founder of Happily Ever Borrowed. Uh, Google that one, it's an interesting business. And then Trinidad Garcia is a FITM alum and owner of a denim brand. They'll be joined by Lizzie Francis, who is a, uh, a, an investor. Uh, a venture capitalist. And I think it's going to be such an interesting conversation. So we look forward to seeing you then. Future sessions will explore the, uh, explore rather the future of social media, the future of e-commerce. We'll look in the first of the year at waste and so much more. So much to talk about. We do hope you join us for these. In the meantime, follow us online at FITM. Uh, we're on every social channel. We're everywhere you want to be. There's FITM to be uh, providing you information. And also, just one last note, whether you're an employer or looking for work, FITM's Career Center is hosting a virtual job fair on September 23rd for our alums and students. It's running from 9 till 3. If you Google FITM Career Center, or FITM Career Fair, it's one of the first results. Easy way to find it. 
uh, for now, thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you had a good lunch and learned a little something with us. And of course, as always, stay inspired. <laughs>